Welcome to Ozcast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. Well, Martin, welcome to Ozcast. Pleasure to be here. It's uh, it's an exciting new little platform that we're launching, and I'm, I'm appreciative of your time to come on here. We're going to chat today about something that I've been tipped off as your expertise, which is freshwater rivers, of yep. course, in Australia, but not only just Australia, potentially some of our neighbouring countries and continents that you've had the, the pleasure to go visit um, and hopefully dive in you know, beneath the surface on, on some of the issues, not only that are threatening our, our freshwater rivers, um, some of the, the resolutions that we're trying to come up with to, to remedy those problems and some of the interesting, weird things that you've, yeah. you know, you've found along the way. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to dive in. We have no script. We're just going to see where, where this goes. First things first, though, I spoke to a mutual connection of ours, yeah. Craig Copeland, who yeah. you've had you know, 20, 30 years of experience with um, and, of course, is the founder of OzFish and is now my boss, yeah. um, believe it or not. And I did say, Craig, I've got Martin booked in for an episode of OzCast. Just tell me one thing. Just one thing about Martin that comes to your head. He was in the car driving home and he said, Jono, I'll tell you this. I worked at the department a long time ago, which is the Department of Fisheries, Fisheries of course. Yeah. And he said, back when I was working, um, when Ozfish is, is you know, approaching its 10-year anniversary in the next coming years, so this is a while ago, he said Martin was constructing, um, creating in some way, engineering the first ever fishways that we, were, you know, we yeah. had in Australia. Um, and he goes, that just speaks to the type of projects that Martin's worked on. Um, over the years. So I think it's a, an appropriate place to start. The first ever fishways in Australia. T- t- tell us about that. Uh, Craig's paying me a huge compliment, yeah, of course, yeah. there. So, so there were you know, lots of people involved in those early stages. But there, there, there's a good story here because we had fishways from, say, 1900 to you know, in the mid-1980s, but, but they weren't working. And, and so I, I, I was engaged by New South Fisheries to have a look at this to work out what was wrong with those fishways and see if we can design them for native fish. There are other people working in this area. John Harris is working in this area. We also had an American consultant come over called George Iker. He recommended doing some research and that's where I came on board. So there were people curious about this space and uh, I, I think I, I came in at the right time. I think I was, I was very lucky. And I ran these lab experiments on swimming speeds of fish, which showed that Native fish could use fishways, and then the Murray-Darling Basin Authority said, let's use that data. We built one at Trumbury, and I monitored it, and it worked. So it was an awesome project, and I was incredibly lucky to be on it. So in 1990, which is, in my you know, my opinion, still quite recent, yeah. we were still as a, a kind of, you know, at a position where we hadn't built a successful fishway yet. Despite the you know yep. the country yep. being civilized and yep. and recreational fishing being around for two hundred years, I know. It's, it's 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 astonishing really, and um, it's and, and probably in the late eighties there were a couple other projects that were starting about that time, but but yeah, but it is incredible that, mm. that it took that that long to get it right. It's it's partly because it's trying to combine different disciplines. So there's engineering, there's civil engineering, there's hydraulic engineering, there's fish biology. Is understanding the hydrology of rivers and so there were all these different disciplines and they really hadn't come together and and so that conversation over a few years of these different disciplines coming together we started to work it out and for the complete novice out there what is a fishway a fishway is just a channel of water around an obstruction like a dam or a weir and that channel of water uh, we, we slow the water down so fish get up it easily. Usually a series of steps, and that's why they're called fish ladders sometimes. And when, Connie, you were working on this, when the team was together, was there this idea that all fish in the world had the same attributes, that they could all you know, navigate different, for example, trout and salmon, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, can, yeah. they can jump, right? Yeah. Was there a lack of education in, in the like, late... 80s, early 90s, around the capabilities of our fish, which is probably part yep. of the problem why we hadn't, you know, built a successful one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's two amazing aspects to that. Firstly, absolutely, yes, we sort of thought if we took these designs based for salmon, they're going to work here. Now, now that's almost a clonal perspective, really, from, from the 1900s, that early. But the other aspect is understanding the fish biology, because you know, we had this sort of salmon model that everyone understands, salmon migrate upstream to spawn, but we had a 
fish doing a whole range of different things. So on the coast, had a lot of fish going downstream to spawn and then a small fish moving upstream. Then in the Murray-Darling, we had fish moving upstream to spawn like golden perch, but then larvae drifting downstream and then juveniles moving upstream. So we had all these different life migration strategies, which, which were not the same as salmon, not the same as the Northern Hemisphere. So we need to understand the biology and then we need to design the fish ways to suit that. And the first, when you built this first successful one, was it like the penny dropped? Was it a little bit, hey, we've, we've done it? I, 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 I have a few moments in my career which are just unbelievable. And the first time this Trumbury fish wave was operated and then we reduced the water flow and it was full of fish. Actually, it, actually, I'm just getting tingles still thinking about it. It was an, an astonishing moment to see these hundreds of native fish in this fish way. I, I, just, I just couldn't believe it because to go from the lab to the field and spend a lot of concrete, a lot of money, you know, a couple of, a couple of million dollars and it it was amazing, it worked. So it was spine tingling. And when you say successful, like for, for those people that don't know anything about this, basically what you've did is, is you're, you've allowed native fish to travel from say point A to point B, yep. which traditionally they wouldn't have been able to, hmm. and they've right. navigated through a construction that, yeah, you, yeah. that you guys engineered. A, 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 an artificial concrete channel with these baffles <laughs> and steps in it, and the fish, yeah, they, they, they went through it. Right, and then yeah, from yeah. then, since the 90s till say, let's say, 2020, for example, yep. has it been, if you were to look on a graph, right, has there yep. been just an exponential increase in the amount of successful, did that, was yes. that the start yes. of a very successful 20, 30 year yeah. period? Yeah, look, and, and in fact, we're, we're, we've used this with, with a, you know, a number of colleagues, we use the same model in, in Asia too, where really you get one good fish way up and running, you demonstrate that it works. Um, so Lee Baumgartner has run that program in Asia. And again, he demonstrated that you can, if you get the research right, fish will use the fish way, yep. and then everyone sees it. And and uh, yeah, so in Australia, it, it's been exponential. Yeah, and then is is I guess like before we get onto the crux of today, which is really what a what a what a quality, what a healthy freshwater yeah. river looks like. Is your industry, is your profession, the type of thing that is is do something right and show it works, and it will spread like wildfire. But until you do that, there's yeah, skeptics. Yeah. Yes, ab absolutely. So yeah. it's all based around, yeah. hey, I've done something, it works, here's the results, this is what we should be doing. And, and, and you, have to, you have to demonstrate it. So, yeah. so, so you can't, and that, that's actually one of the flaws of the fishways built you know, for 80 years is that no one actually went and saw if they were working. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't collect data on it. We didn't do monitoring. So yeah, you're quite right. You just got to demonstrate that it works. And in fact, look, it's 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 not a binary thing. It works or it doesn't. You're usually refining the design. You say, oh, you've got lots of this right. We can do better here. Mm. So so in fact, there are lots of scientists now working in this area, and they're all you know making these designs better all the time. So if if you just said something there, like around the '90s, you figured out that that fishways weren't designed great, right? Yeah. Between, let's say that, like we know that there's only really a 150 year period before that where these things were happening, right? And we took out all the snags. Yeah. Do we have any other failures that we did as a country for our freshwater rivers that you can identify, i.e. taking all the snags out of the river, i.e. fishways, yep. i.e. Yep. like what are, what are some of the biggest failures that we were just not educated on that could have changed the path for native fish in freshwater rivers today? Yeah, yeah. Look, it's it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge question. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic question. I love it actually because it gives me scope. Yeah. So look, you know, water and flow is huge. Look, so really, the, the Australian community in the Murray Darling Basin has struggled with the with the water issue, but yeah, rivers need water number one, and we allocated too much water for industry, and uh, and not enough for rivers. So so that there's just no getting past that. So the, the basin plan, and I'm focusing on the Murray-Darling Basin here, but the basin plan is addressing some of that, and so is you know getting 20% of that water back for the environment. That may or may not be enough, and that and that's an important. This is not a fix, mm. and so we need to again monitor that to find out if it's enough. My view in the northern basin is it's not enough, and the demonstration of that is what happened in the Millennium Drought. And um, even though we released environmental flow, it just didn't make it down to Mindy. There was still zero flow at Will Canyon. So um, just providing water is, is number one. Desnagging was a huge um, impact from you know maybe 1860 through to you know 1910, and then they kept resnagging. But 
but mainly the Murray up to Echuca and the Darling, you know, up to almost Wagga, but certainly Bawarana. And, and that was a massive government subsidised program. Millions of dollars were spent on taking those snags out. And um, there are old navigation maps that show that the snags were abundant. And of course, the paddle steamers didn't like them. But this is the main freeway, if you like. So they're making the freeway for the paddle steamers clearer. So that was huge. But actually, another thing that people don't talk about, um, but Aboriginal people talk about, is they removed rocks and they removed, they cut channels in rock bars, and in doing so in the Darling, they destroyed Aboriginal fish traps as well. So rocks are actually a, a big part of fish habitat, and uh, rocks provide, you know, sort of sort of this hydraulic diversity, is what I call it, you know, flow patterns are mixing up, and there are lots of, you know, crustaceans that like that, lots of fish that like that. And, uh, we, and, and we, when we spoke earlier that uh, you've probably heard of trout cod, so trout cod is, uh, one of our threatened species has declined. It's also you know, quite a good recreational species. It, in South Australia, was known as rock cod. So it, it was a, a, sort of always around these rock bars and rocks. So that's a really important habitat. And that brings me to something that you know, I'm passionate about is one of, I think, one of the biggest impacts is the weirs throughout the Murray-Darling Basin or weirs in general. So weirs create a series of pools. So your flowing river becomes this series of pools, and that's completely different. So in the Lower Murray, that's 1,000 kilometers of river. So a series of pools built for paddle steamers, now partly used for irrigation. But what people don't know is those weirs are not a storage of water. They're just sitting there as a pool. They create this still water habitat, and so Murray, uh, sort of trout cod are no longer found there. Murray crayfish love flowing water, they're no longer found in South Australia. And Murray cod, the best spawning and recruitment and recruitment survival of young fish is found in these flowing water habitats. So that's a huge impact. If you look at the Darling River, there's a series of weirs and 40% of the Darling River are now weir pools. That's a massive loss of flowing water habitat and native fish love that habitat. So they're the, you, you'd be confident to say that they're the, the four or three biggest issues that you... That, well, I'll add one more too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so the other, other huge one, yeah. Because we're going to break these down. Yeah, it's all right. Another huge one, apart from taking the flow out, is cold water pollution from large dams. It, it is huge. So it has an impact, you know, maybe that's you know, a couple hundred kilometres downstream a dam, over five dams. That's another thousand kilometres of river. Now, so this science around this... Is, is done and dusted. We know if you fix that, you'll get better outcomes for native fish. And we know if you have a flowing river and not a series of weir pools, we know it's better for native fish. So, so right now, which is why I'm here in this Ozcast, is we need the community to understand that we have the tools to do it. And if the community makes the choices, um, and, and I'm a scientist, I can give that information to people, but the community needs to make the choice. Right, so the demise of Australian freshwater rivers is not a single we don't pin no. it on a single, you know, just cold water pollution, just yeah. with. It is the combination yeah. of basically tampering with our rivers over the course of 100, maybe 200 years, yeah. which, and each of them have their own little impact. Yeah. And the result of that, the sum of that, yeah. is all of them a little bit impact native fish to the point where we have serious problems like well, we're Absolutely. experiencing, we've experienced blackwater events, you know, the carp play, yes. what, hundreds of them, right? Yeah. So if we add all them together, now I want to break a little a little bit of them down. As a freshwater ecologist, is there any one of those four that you just mentioned that you've taken specific interest in or special interest in and you've do donated or devoted more of your time to? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I, I think a passion of mine is certainly the impacts of weirs on this flame water habitat. Right. And uh, because... And, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for this. I've appreciated now that that loss of species, in, say in the lower thousand kilometres of, of the Murray and you know over this many, many kilometres in the Darling, that loss is fixable. And, uh, and this is also fixable without adding water. And, and that to me is an easy win for all stakeholders. Now, there are, there are lots of other issues around that. People like the... the the sort of site of a weir pool around a town. So, so maybe some near towns you, you might want to keep. There's lots of 
European cultural heritage around weir pools. It's not Aboriginal cultural heritage. So their heritage is around flowing rivers. And so those weir pools are, I, I think, something we need to address. The other, other amazing thing is there's a strong logic around addressing this. In, this, in the South Australia up to um, you know, into New South Wales, Victoria, those weirs were built for paddle steamers. Now there's a small, in, there is a significant industry around paddle steamers, and yes, and we'll have to sort of you know protect that. But the original commercial reason for these weirs is gone. So this is not like the Rhine or the Missouri or the Mississippi overseas. They're not commercially rivers with you know literally all the tankers going up and down the rivers. So they used to be, didn't they? they used to be the highway. They, they were the highway, and and we were investing huge amounts of federal money. This was a massive federal project to build these weirs. It was one of it was like the snowy scheme. It was huge. Right. Yeah. So you know how trucks basically Australia runs off trucks. Yep. You know, back then. It was, was accessed via rivers through paddle stems. It was 100%. And, and, you, and you see these photographs, these paddle stems, and then this huge barge behind it just covered in, in wool bales. And, and, and right now, I think about 1870s, not right now, right then, 1870s, 1880s, rail started to take off. Yeah. And, and, and there was even some commentary in the newspapers at the time that Victoria was deliberately you know, adding more rail so they'd get more of the trade. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and then, interestingly, rail took off to the point where they didn't build, they didn't finish the project. They were going to have more weirs on the Murray mm. and they, they didn't finish them. So, so it's, pretty, it's, it's interesting to think that I'm always interested in the benefits or, or the arguments put forward to originally have weirs. Right? Yeah. Because often they're outdated. And like you just said, yeah, they yeah, are yeah. outdated. Yeah, so the main yeah, ones yeah. was the paddle steamers, paddle but steamers. then the access to water for towns. So what's a, what's a common weir that people might know of? Like, does every town, every, every, every town, town, every have town one? on the Darling, if, if you're in a river that occasionally stops like the Darling River, you, your water supply is the weir pool. Right. So, so, so you have a you know, three meter high weir, it backs up water. Yep. But, and, and you know, that probably was a good decision in 1940, 1960, yep. maybe. But when, when you look at the sort of, the scientists look at the water balance, how much do you lose in evaporation? A good example is say, uh, a Will Kenya Weir, where you to store, to, sorry, to deliver 500 megalitres, that's a million litres, 500 megalitres in a drought to the town, you need to store 5,000 in the river. So oh. you're losing 4,500 in evaporation. That, that's not good water policy by, by any, any nation, that's a waste of water. So, so, that, that's, so that's just on water basics. Then you add the impact on fish and you think, why are we, why are we doing this now? Yep. So yeah, there, there are alternatives and, and people use off-stream. Irrigators use off-stream storage all the time. Okay, cotton farmers use off-stream storage. So we should be using off-stream storage for towns and, uh, and we should be removing weirs and, and adding habitat at the same time so you mentioned the effect on fish let's let's get into that if, if you're if you're a native fish let's use the murray cod or the golden perch yep. or yellow whatever let's just use two of the iconic ones yeah before weirs they had unrestricted travel let's use the basin yep, yep absolutely they had unrestricted travel yep. they could go there was no you know this is before we started building basically yep. barriers weirs yep. all that they could do whatever they wanted but yep. but why does a fish need that what is it about the unrestricted travel the flow of water that benefits a fish. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 a brilliant point, and and in fact, so you know, we mentioned earlier, I I worked in the Mekong. There's incredible parallels between some fish biology in the Murray Darling Basin and some fish in the Mekong. And one of them is fish like golden perch. They have larvae that drift with the current, and to counter that, they have to migrate upstream in the spawning season, and they might migrate you know hundreds of kilometres. They're known to migrate thousands of kilometres, but certainly hundreds of kilometres. Because with the flowing water, the larvae will drift down hundreds of kilometres. So, so this is a cycle that happens. That they, they think nothing of swimming 100 kilometres. I mean, I, I can't walk 100 kilometres. Yeah, how yeah, do they yeah, do yeah. that? Yeah. And, and his golden perch, the fish is big. So it thinks nothing of swimming 200 kilometres. So that's a huge energetic cost. And to do that, they do that because they've got to protect their larvae. So, um, so the free-flowing rivers means the adults get upstream and the larvae drift downstream and they don't get sink in weir pools as well. So, and now interesting, Murray cod are interesting because they, 
don't have to migrate you know a long distance sometimes they do and but they also they also prefer to spawn in flying water they'll actually spawn anywhere because there's no other conditions but they prefer spawning in flow water and they will migrate you know short distances to, to, to that flowing water it might be 10 kilometers or, or 90 kilometers and they will spawn there and they have a, a small number of eggs they protect them but when the larvae hatch they're quite big they also will drift a bit with the current and then head to the sides of the bank so there's a smaller scale there of drift but the flowing water is where you get the best married cod juveniles, the best survival. And is there data on that to say that Lots. the place, yeah, yeah. is oh, there, yeah. is there a, you might know the place, but is there research to say that the place in one of these rivers in the basin that have two weirs at the most, at the furthest point apart. So for example, if you had a weir yep. every, yep. Yep. you know, every interval, there would be a place where there is two weirs that are the furthest apart than any yes. other weir. Yes. Is that arguably one of the more healthy than the next yes, section of river. absolutely and, and in fact I, I i was incredibly lucky uh in the first fishway that, that was built at trumbury weir downstream at trumbury weir is 500 kilometers of flowing water habitat because they they didn't end up building all the weirs so the murray's is free flowing river for 500 kilometers that is the best silver perch population by far in the basin it's also it's murray no cod it's no coincidence it's also got you know great golden perch. It's also got great Murray crayfish. It's got freshwater mussels. In other words, it's got a river ecosystem, and it's no coincidence. And, and I've said this at conferences. I think we should make that an aquatic reserve, where we should say right now this is an aquatic reserve, and then we should have a discussion about what, what does that mean. Number one, it means no more weirs, and number one, we guarantee water for, for that reach in summer because what's going to happen in fifty or hundred years? There'll be more pressure. So I, I think we should start allocating aquatic reserves. And, Is that um, basically a, a saltwater marine park? It, it, it would be what the community wants, I reckon. Right. It's an now, open discussion. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, I think it's an open discussion. But, but from, from my viewpoint, the number one premise is no more development of that river. Mm. <laughs> no more weirs, I, I, I think, is, is what. So, so I, I, have a, I have a project in... I'm trying to get going in South Australia with Craig, actually, where we, we remove a weir. And part of that, where we recreate this flowing river, is maybe we create a trophy fishery out of it. You know, we, we'll get Murray, we know we'll get Murray Cobb back there. We know that they'll do well. And, and then we say, you know, this reach, you can be guaranteed to catch, you know, Murray Cod. Maybe this is a catch and release Murray Cod. And so you have this tourism venture. Mm. And say, so, look, come to Australia, catch a big Murray Cod. Promote tourism, generates money, generates, it boosts everyone, right? Absolutely. So when you say the removal of weir, let's get to some of these solutions you're talking about. Are yeah. you quite literally talking about knocking down a concrete structure within a river? Is that what a removal of a weir looks like? Yes. Yes, it is. There's no, you know, pretty actually, way to they're, put they're, they're, yeah. Actually, they're, 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 there's lots of hybrid versions. Yeah. But, but, but look, and in fact, actually South Australia has an amazing opportunity here because the, the weir is actually sort of a concrete base and concrete sides and there are these stop logs that you actually pull out. So in fact, you can just, you could remove half the weir. You can remove a quarter, three quarters. You can actually do whatever you like in South Australia with those <laughs> weirs, if, if the community wants it. So, so they're pillars, right? Yeah, So there's yeah. pillars in and then they've built they're, the weir up on the inside and you could technically just take one layer off at a time. Right, right now, there's a flood on and all the, what's called stop logs are out. So the river is free flowing through the weir at the moment. It's a free flowing river. That's, the, that's good, right? That's fantastic. That's right. That's right. So, so that that you can do. So that's absolutely sitter. But lots of other weirs on the in the Darling or other you know, tributaries, uh, concrete weirs, and then yes, you you would have to uh, remove those and provide a better alternative water source. And and when I say better, is that weirs are not a good place to store water in summer because the water heats up. You get blue green algae. You can't drink it. You can't swim in it. So really, what you want to have is off-stream storage. You want to cover it. Once you cover it, you stop the light getting in. And so now you've got really your blue-green algal risk. You've got potable water supplies, which is secure for town water. So, you know, we are a resource. I regard Australia as a resourceful nation. We're resourceful. We're not afraid of innovation. We're happy to have a go at things. This water management, we need to have a good crack at this now. I've got, an, I've got a really basic question for you that I think someone listening who you know maybe on the salt maybe based on a saltwater you know estuary or something like that that doesn't deal with the basin a lot yeah. but you might be able to answer it 
The idea seems for, for everything we've ever done, all the developments with empowerment, weirs, seems to be this obsession, irrigators with storing water. Yeah. That seems to be the yeah. crux of a lot of the problems that we've, yeah. is storing water because of this fear that it's gonna run out, right? Yeah. Before we were here, right? When the basin was running naturally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did it dry out? Is, is, the, is the absence of water an actual, oh, it, it, it baffles me to think that a free-flowing river eventually would, would, gets would so low. Out. Okay, so so that's so, so what's yeah? What's yeah, this, okay. explain the idea of storing yeah, water? Yeah, so storing water actually. Okay, so so you know, so so there's a, there's a fundamental uh, principle here. The large dams essentially store water for summer. You know, if you like, when when, when there's less rainfall. So irrigation, you know, the the growth season is you know you know spring, summer, autumn and maybe your rainy season's more in winter, you store water in winter, and then you release it for irrigation in spring and summer and autumn. So if you didn't store the water, there would not be enough water to support irrigation. And irrigation agriculture in New South Wales is worth 4.5 billion yep. per year. So, so, you, so you have to store water to sustain present agriculture. And then we need to sustain that because that's such a big part of the Australian economy. Yes. That's right, and, and, and it produces food, it produces fibre, mm. there, 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 there's lots of really, really good things it does, but you can do that and do it way smarter. And, and you don't want to deliver cold water out of dams, number one, that's an obvious one. And then if you commit to that dam, and they're already committed, why have a series of low level weirs downstream? So, so they're actually highly impactful to, mm. to fish populations. So, so, so there's not there, there's not an anti-irrigation, anti-dam theme here. There, there's there's a, just a smarter way of managing the river for native fish theme here. So, you know, some some of those rear weirs can be taken out. Some, you know, uh, are used to divert agriculture water, like large amounts, big diversion weirs, and, and you have to keep some of those. But we need to stand back and have a vision. Of, of what we want for the, you know, the river and healthy fish and healthy rivers, and it's not blue green algae, it's not fish kills, it's not full of carp, and we're, we're smart enough to do it, but it but it takes a commitment, and basically we're still running on a '60s water management paradigm, a, a sort of a way of managing water. We can do this better. Is it fair to say that all the work we did throughout the 1800s and the early 1900s will eventually in the next hundred years be completely reversed in the it, sense of putting snags back in yes removing the weirs they oh, originally yeah. built yeah, yeah yeah stopping the stopping the build of more dams and impoundments yeah they're all things they did and now yeah. it seems to me as someone outside looking in that we're now reversing what they've done uh, abs uh, absolutely so so, so the, the, the habitat destruction that, that's happened yeah look we're, we're, we'll, we'll be at this this is decades and decades mm. I, I can see 50 you know 100 year program here Absolutely. So, so that that loss of snags of rocks, you know, yeah, those, those barriers. Yes, some will add fish waste to, but some will remove. Will add flame water, you know, by removing some weirs. We will we will definitely do it. And the reasons we'll do it is they're just good ideas that all the scientists agree. And if you've got all the scientists agreeing, eventually these ideas happen. They always happen. Good ideas just float, and you think, well, maybe we should do that. And yeah, we get more fish back and what, we're saving water? Okay, well, we'll do that. Are you optimistic about the future? I am. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about the future because I see a sustainable agriculture. I, I see, you know, a vibrant agriculture and vibrant rivers. And I, and I just need, I want the community to understand that we have choices. And I mean, it, it is about choices we make and we need to tell our politicians these are choices. They're active choices. So, you know, you know we, we can't just say, oh, look, this, this fish kill is bad. If we don't want that fish kill to happen again in Menindee, we can prevent it. One of the things I'm interested in is a lot of the, the, the dialogue, the, the literature is all around the basin. Yes. And admittedly so, yes, it, yes, is, yes. it is huge, yes. right? It's massive and it's, it, it, yeah. it, it provides nutrients and water yeah. to so much of our agriculture. But I agree. I think a lot of the discussion is ignoring some of our freshwater oh, rivers on the I east agree. coast. Right? I agree. Yes, so yes. from you know yeah. we're based in Sydney yeah. at the moment right now, but yep. from here all the way up to southeast Queensland, I agree. There is tons of beautiful bass fisheries, Murray yep. cod fisheries that I've fished a lot of them. Weirs oh, aren't yeah. a big of a problem. Yep. 
but it's not to say they're in great condition. That yeah. I reckon they're in better condition than some of the basin. But let's talk about let's get away from the basin a little bit and yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. your experience in some of these. Yeah. And these are the rivers, of course, for those that are listening that are running into the the ocean. Yep. These are the ones that are starting on the, the Great Dividing Range and flowing yeah. down oh, yeah. you know, through the town. So yeah. I think, I, this is just an opinion, that those rivers are ignored in some of the, the mainstream discussion around the health of rivers in Australia. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree. And the, the nice thing is they are a bit healthy <laughs> for, for a start. So that's good. But actually, they're, they're, there's, there's a couple of things being, being overlooked. And well, actually, so fish migration, in so coastal rivers... A lot of these fish, as I mentioned earlier, migrate downstream to breed, and therefore they've got to get past these uh, tidal barriers and other weirs. So there's still lots of weirs. There's a few rivers without any weirs, but there's still lots of weirs, and that's still a significant issue. So fish passage, getting migrating fish past these barriers in coastal rivers, you know, it's well acknowledged by, um, by by many scientists and many managers, and that's an important problem. It probably doesn't get a high, as high a profile, but but the but one of the things that doesn't get a much profile in coastal rivers, which I think is incredibly significant and is going to get increasingly uh, significant with climate change, is freshwater flow to the estuary. So, so what happens is, is we have stores in, uh, in freshwater and dams, and then in summer, of course, there's very low flows, and then we will divert that for water supplies. And Australia is a coastal nation, so many people living on the coast. So these water supplies are critical. You go to many tidal barriers uh, on the east coast, um, this is New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and there'll be zero freshwater flow to the estuary. And estuary is actually a mix of freshwater and salt water. It is not a marine uh, sort of environment. And the estuary supports estuarine species. So, you know, you have lots of brim and whiting that are just found in estuaries and you, you don't get them out in outer reefs. So there's a bunch of estuarine fishes and we don't talk enough about what freshwater flows we need to the estuary to support those estuarine fisheries. And yet, wow, that, I, I started fishing in the estuary. I, I reckon most people start fishing in the estuary. And, and so that is such a common thing. So they, they need fresh water for productivity. You get a freshwater pulse, they get more productive. Therefore, you, know, you get larvae of you know, brim and flathead surviving. So you get better fish populations. So that's important. And throughout the world now, in a lot of these rivers, the predictions are in summer, they'll have less flow and less, you know, there'll be more pressure on estuaries. And, and of course, coastal actually communities, actually even worldwide, people like the coast. And there's more pressure on the freshwater reserves. So why isn't the water getting to the getting to the estuary, getting it, to the mouth? It, it, it doesn't get to the mouth because it gets pumped out for water supply. Right, and those but, water supplies yeah. are any basically coastal coastal any town, town, any town based across. Pick any yeah. river, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you, could, you could pick any river. Yeah. There's towns along it, and they're utilising that water. Yes, I, I, I tell you an, an amazing fact for me um, is the Murray Basin is huge. It's a huge catchment in the Millennium Drought. Which had, was for those... For, for, oh, yeah, for, so from 2000 to 2011, uh, so, so, so 10 years of, of extreme drought. Of that entire Maritime Basin, there was a long, long period, 13 months maybe, with a zero flow to the sea. How can an entire river system have all your water allocated to get zero flow to the sea? It gets worse than that. It gets worse. I could not believe it. In fact... It, the Murray comes down to Lake Alexandrina, and then, with evaporation, it starts to get lower than the sea. It's unbelievable, and and lots of people on the east coast didn't realise this, and uh, so so that was an extraordinary event, and they, and they were facing situation where they're holding back the sea, and yet this fresh water was evaporating. It could have gone hypersaline. It could have been the worst fish kill in the southern hemisphere, and in the end, it wasn't. But that, that's how critical the, the, this this last bit you hit towards the coast and you're not providing enough flow to estuaries and we're not we're not having a discussion around what freshwater flows need to sustain estuarine fisheries so it's basically the water's coming down let's say a hundred percent of the water's coming down yep. every time it travels a few kilometers we're taking one or two percent yeah 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 we're doing one or two percent damage one to the point when it gets to the end yeah it's a hundred percent damage exactly that's what happened that's in yeah in, in the Murray, 110 yeah, percent. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. I mean, and, and what about floods? What's what about what about yeah. the, the current scenario that we just saw, which was we had a flood, yeah, basically. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Now you talk you talk about the 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 millennia drought. What about 
how do things like weirs cope when there's an excess amount of water? Is yeah, it a problem yeah. then? No, no. Most of these low-level weirs are underwater now. Yeah. So, so in, in the, the lower Murray, the, the, these you know, stop logs are taken out, so the weirs are, or the rivers free-flowing through those weirs, um, the, and the darling, those weirs are actually underwater. This is the, the one time when fish, the native fish, can migrate upstream and they can spawn, and the larvae can drift downstream. So, uh, yeah, these are usually very good events for native fish. I feel as though a lot of the commentary on mainstream media is around how bad a flood can be. And obviously yeah, yeah, loss, of, lo loss of life's terrible. Like yeah, no, yeah, no yeah, one's yeah. doubting that. Yeah. But for native fish, it's a positive story. It's a, it's a very positive story. And, 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 and unfortunately, when, when I see those floods, I also think the fish biology side of it thinking, wow, we've got inundation of floodplains. When, when that happens, you get higher productivity. So it means you get you know zooplankton and then you know, juvenile fish can eat those zooplankton and then you get next year, you get a lot of great fish appearing. So so floods are, are fantastic for native fish. Is an event like a, a blackwater event that we've had recently, yep. do you think that is milked a little bit or over-exaggerated in the sense that when I hear of a flood and I hear of blackwater, I, the, the media is just, oh my God, these, all these fish are dying, all these fish are dying, all these fish are dying yeah, for yeah, a, yeah. a few weeks. But is the fact that long term over the next two years it's actually going to be a positive story you know I, what i mean yeah, like, yeah i know you, you, you're absolutely right it's a short-term pain yes. for what is a long-term gain is that, yeah, yeah. Is that fair look I, i'm so I'm, I'm not sure what impact so in some of the blackwater events uh it's hard to gauge from the media how widespread they are and, and even from colleagues because you know the river's huge mm. you don't know if this is the entire river it usually isn't it's usually patchy but it makes extremely good footage and uh so yes yeah, and some of it has been, you know, widespread, and that, and they will be significant impacts. So, so it, it's worth stating those big black water events. There's also a bit of a narrative here. They think, oh, that's sort of like a natural event. You've got a big flood; it's a natural event. Those big black water events, those big fish kills, are not natural events. Under natural circumstances, what happens is you get this flood every year. It goes over the floodplain, and then. Uh, you get you know leaves and organic matter coming in, and the floodplain is cleaned of this every year. So you get low amounts of what's called carbon, which is like you know you know dried you know eucalyptus leaves, and the carbon starts this productivity cycle of zooplankton, etc. In the past, with regular floods, you had these low amounts of carbon, but when you hold back all the floods in dams, and you don't get flood for one year, two, five, eight, ten, and then you suddenly get a flood. You've got 10 years of build-up, plus you've got agriculture, you've got a cattle, you've got additional nutrients come in, and then you've got a one in 10 year pulse of nutrients that comes into the river. It's just very predictable. So a, a, a low level blackwater event, positive. A little, so. little bit step up, yeah, still yeah, positive. Yeah. Yeah. is when you have a big gap and then it takes all of that organic matter is when you go right. You, 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 get, these, you get these big fish curls and, and, and it's not good, mm. absolutely. I'm interested um, kind of moving away from that. You've done a lot of travel in your time. Um, I know you're, you're, you know, you're, you're teaching and you're doing programs around uh, the, the world, I reckon you could say. Have you had the chance to ever sit back and reflect as to whether other countries and other countries' rivers are experience a similar trend in the issues that they've had in the past, in the sense that they've had, like we have a relatively young history here in Australia, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You've been to countries yeah, yeah. that have thousands yeah. of years yeah, of history. Yeah, yeah. Have they been through a similar trend where, you know, they did the wrong thing and now they've reversed it and they're at a better spot now because they've had basically more time to do it? Or has Australia just been a great example of a country that stuffed it up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 mainly I've been working in, in Southeast Asia, and um, and if you if you like, uh, I mean, at the moment uh, I've been working in Cambodia, and Cambodia's probably got three thousand years of irrigation, and um, and the, and they were a, a huge kingdom as a result of it. The, 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 they were they were a dominant force. You know, uh, you go back a couple of thousand years. And uh, so they had really sophisticated terraces and irrigation for rice. I, I think that they were the first to start storing water and having two rice crops a year. So th they had a long history of irrigation, but they have a huge history in fish and protecting fish. And you know, in Cambodia, as an example, 
They have this huge lake called the Tonley Sap Lake, which is connected to the Meikle River, and has this big flood pulse every year, and this huge productivity of fish. So, uh, you know, for Cambodian people, 80% of their, their protein comes from fish. So they're, they're committed to, you know, preserving their fish as part of their culture. It's in, it's in their sort of carvings, and, uh, but they are utterly committed to preserving it. And so, so that's, that's where they come from over thousands of years. So at the, but at the moment, what they're seeing, and, and I think of Cambodia and adjoining is Thailand and then Laos and downstream is Vietnam. What they're seeing now is a template of modern development, which is completely different. So hydropower dams in the Mekong, these are huge dams. These are you know, 30 metres high and 300 metres across and you know, cost 4 billion US. These are huge hydropower dams, generate a lot of electricity very hard to get migrating fish heading upstream and going back downstream through hydropower turbines. So, so this is a new modern template being put on an old, you know, amazing river system. I mean, that's, the system has huge freshwater stingrays, you know, that are, you know, three metres across. It has huge giant Mekong catfish, you know, three metres, and, and it's got freshwater dolphins in it. You know, I mean, this is an amazing river. You know, in the, in the wet season, it's, yeah, you may, you know, kilometre, kilometre and a half across, 30 metres deep, and, and travelling like this, you couldn't swim against it. So it's an amazing river system, and it's now at, at high risk. So I, I think they've had sustainable irrigation practices, and, and they've protected and valued their fish, and, uh, but right now they're under a whole new range of pressures. Do you think they've experienced the same problems that we have had, though? Like, have you... Have you dived into that at all to think what's the biggest issue that they're facing and is there any relationship between what we're doing here in Australia or is it just a completely different system because it's so big? It's, it, it's, it's incredible for me that, that the parallels because it's, Australia is this island continent. It, it, for freshwater fish, it's not highly diverse. It might have 200. Well, it's a Murray-Darling, 45. And the Mekong's 1,000, 1,500. You know, it's a huge number of species. So you would think this, they'd be completely different. And in fact... As an example, there are all these different carp species and catfish species in the Mekong, and then as you come across what's called the Wallace line, we don't have those, you know, these fork-tailed, or we have a different sort of fork-tailed catfish, but we don't have the carp species, apart from introduced carp. But a suite of different species, amazingly, there's a couple of life history things that they do, and one is this drifting larvae. In the rivers, they migrate upstream to spawn and the larvae drift downstream, which is what golden perch and silver perch do. So there are some amazing parallels here. And so they, um, they, they target their fishing. They have these fish traps that target the fishing and the upstream migration, which is exactly what Aboriginal people did with their fish traps along the Darling. They target these upstream migrations, but they always you know, let fish through as well. And the larvae came downstream. So lots of parallels there. The big one now, right now, is irrigation development in the Mekong is time to parallel what we're doing. And even though the Mekong's a big river, there are lots of smaller rivers that have quite low flows in the dry season, a bit like the Murrumbidgee, Lachlan, the Darling, a lot of our rivers. And so they're diverting right now too much water for irrigation. They're making the same mistakes we're, we're doing, and then their rivers are getting less and less water. They've tampered with their rivers less, though, haven't they? They have. The, the, within those countries, they've tampered with them a lot less up until now, where, where they've now gotten these new developments in uh, of larger infrastructure and you know, you know, bigger weirs, bigger dams. Yeah. So that's interesting. And as the storm rolls in, for those listening, you might hear the thunder. So it's interesting because their history is so much bigger than ours. So you said 3,000 years of irrigation, where we've yeah. had maybe 250 years. Yes. But to think that we've done more in 250 years than they've done in 3,000 years. Yeah. Just goes to show how quickly we kind of hit the ball running when when we you know. probably did. That's right. <laughs> is there so as we kind of you know move to what what a what a great freshwater river looks like in Australia, right? Yeah. We've discussed what the the biggest issues are. Is there a river in Australia right now that you think is a perfect example of what a river should look like, or are we at the point where there is none? Or in your oh, world. Actually, actually, yeah, of course, actually. Look, the, the Ovens River is an example. You know, I'm thinking the Murray Darling, the Ovens River is, uh, that's, a, that's a lovely river upstream. Uh, it, ha it has no dams or weirs on it. It has good water quality. It has actually pretty good snags in it. Um, yeah, no, it, it's a good river. On the coast, there's a few that have no dams and a lot, almost all national parks. There's a few on the coast that are absolutely stunning. 
Yeah. And what's stunning for you? Stunning so, for you is good riparian zone, good, snags. Good riparian zone. Yeah, so 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 vegetation, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and uh, good snags, good uh, rocks, good aquatic macrophytes. Um, no, not very turbid. Oh, in fact, that's right. So, so some of these rivers are really quite clear. I, I, I tell you what, what's amazing for me in, in the Murray-Darling is, is when I first started working in the mid-80s on the Murray and I talked to the weir keepers there and, and they've been there, you know, for, say, you know, 50 years, they said up until the 50s and 60s, the Murray at times would be clear, clear for like three to four metres, crystal clear. And, 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 and that's, that's their lifetime. And I'm, I'm looking at this turbid river and, I, and I'm saying, well, yeah, are you sure? He said, yeah, yeah, c crystal clear because they, they, they'd be throwing lures, these big lures. They could see the Murray Cod and they'd be throwing big lures to them. And I, I thought that was an exaggeration, but I heard that many times. And then I asked more people that lived on the river. I heard that many times of, of the Murray. So, so that's, that was 40s and 50s, crystal clear. So we've already had quite a bit of land clearing at that point. And he said, yes, look, when there was big flows on, it would go turbid. But when it became low and uh, slowed down, it went clear. He said every summer it would clear up. Now I'm going to tell you something more amazing that stunned me. I thought that was the Murray. I heard the same story on the Darling. And, and, and people in Darling think, okay, that's turbid, you know, 24-7. It's naturally not turbid 24-7. And, and again, it, it was the same. In, in the 50s and 60s, um, you know, there were periods in low flow when it was clear, you could see two to three metres. And once you can see, that means light gets through and that means aquatic plants can grow. And once you get aquatic plants, you get snails, you get lots of other you know, invertebrates, and then you get more native fish. So, so it just sounds like tibidis are this odd, funny thing that, that can drive an ecosystem, it can drive native fish. So. So the Darling was like that in summer, in low flows, up until the 60s. And it's probably my favourite conversation to have yeah. with fellow anglers is what was fishing like 100 years ago? Yeah, I love the conversation. I love, I love, because <laughs> we weren't here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, obviously our grandparents, yeah. great-grandparents were, but we don't have access yeah. to them. We have access to certain yeah. archival, you know, photos and, and reports. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the, the percentage of things that were actually recorded the, you know, one or two percent, if you think about it. Like, yeah. Yeah, our, our oh, grandparents yeah, yeah, aren't sure. writing papers and it wasn't a big yeah, thing yeah. back then, right? So one of my favourite things to dive into is what what was the Murray like? What was the Darwin yeah, like? Yeah. What was the Bellinger like? What was Sydney Harbour like? You know, what was it like before we tampered with them? I know. And what is the realistic possibility of that being ever, ever basically getting back to that point? Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. we got too far? And there's pessimists and optimists, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I would like to think people like you... Yeah, the fact that you're optimistic about it is a good sign. Yeah, but like you said, it's a hundred year. Oh, look, look. So, so yeah, so so I, you had this discussion. Can, can we get back to what it was? No, absolutely not. So, so first of all, you need to be clear about what you know what we're trying to do. We're absolutely at a at a very very low point of native fish, and and I, I think it's you know close to losing quite common species. I, I I think we're at a pivotal time. What's the next species to go? I have to think about that one, <laughs> but but um, but there is a vision where you have agriculture, you have town water supplies. There is a vision here for massively improving native fish, and and it is not going to get back to where it was. Oh wow! But it will be such a massive improvement on, his, on what it is now. Absolutely. So you don't need much to make it better than it is now. Well, it's, it's pretty that's poor. right. Yeah, it's 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 pretty poor, but 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 you need. We, we as a community need to say we want to do this. Requires buy-in. We we want buy-in, and and then you know there's actually a lot of really good politicians that are really keen mm. on, on on that sort of vision, and so so we need to keep influencing them. One of the things you kind of mentioned at the outset, which I'm, so I just want to dive back into just quickly. You said when you first discovered that your first fish way was successful, yeah. you, you had goosebumps. Oh right? yeah. What are some other projects throughout your career, maybe just one or two, that have given you a similar sensation? That there's been a similar breakthrough, if any, you know, a, a similar project where you've gone, hang on, this is big. This is big for the history yeah, yeah, of yeah. native fish, freshwater, yeah. you know, rivers yeah. in Australia. Is there any that ring a bell? Yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> well, actually, actually, first of all, when I, when I was in the lab, 
and I had a full scale model of this fishway and I'd put, put fish down the bottom and, uh, and they didn't use it. And I thought, what, 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 what's going on here? I mean, so I had these little bass, I put, put it down the bottom and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'd go there during the day, I'd work from nine to five, no, nothing would happen. I'd put this bass in the bottom and I, and I, was, I thought, God, what, what am I doing wrong here? And, uh, and then um, I thought, what I'll do is I'll just run the whole thing overnight. And I came in the morning and the whole lot of these juvenile fish were up the top and it was another those moments like, what, what happened here? This is amazing. They, went, they, they did it. So, and later on I found out they just moved at dawn. And so I, I then had to work from like, you know, four to seven. But it was uh, just a moment from, you know, and I've been working for months on this and got zero. And then at this moment, bang, fishways work. So fishways work for native fish. <laughs> it, was, it was a time in the day. It was a time of the day. And, and then all my experience and, and the person I was working with didn't like it, but we had to work at dawn. So to, and to actually worked. see them navigate it, and and to actually get get the results. Otherwise, the fish are sat there. No, it wouldn't wouldn't touch anything. So when you turn yeah. the light on in the morning, you lit up the lab and you walked in and you're having a look. Was it again like a moment of? Oh, it was a moment. I go, I, I, I can see it so clearly in, in yeah, my mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, well, it's just so clear. Uh, it was just because I went, you know, kept working. Nothing was happening. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah, getting yeah, no yeah, results. Yeah. And and various people say, "How's it going? Good." <laughs> but isn't that isn't that your industry? Isn't the idea that nothing happening isn't a failure? It's that we yeah, need to find learn, another option. Uh, well, and, and and actually, and and and, and no result. You've learned something, and yeah, and right. and you just keep. Even though you, you think oh, I've got no data, I've learned something. I've learned every single time. I, I've learned something. So um, yeah, no, it's 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 never a failure. It's always amazing. And is there another time that yeah, kind of rings a bell? Yeah, there is. <laughs> actually, the, the, this is a bizarre one because I'm looking at a spreadsheet. And uh, so, so how, how can a spreadsheet be exciting? Okay, so, so, so what we've done, so this is uh, 1990, and uh, you've heard the story about you look at the ear bones of fish, and, and you can age fish but by the ear bones, so they have a ring on the ear bone, and you could say that fish was born three years ago and four years ago. At the time, golden perch uh, and silver perch were said they will only you know, do big spawning events in big floods. So, okay, and that, so that's fine, everyone's saying that. Then when I look at these, this spreadsheet, I start to see the ages of these fish, and then I, I remember looking across to the flows in those years, and they were spawning in these small flow events, n not the big ones. So they were spawning in these ones that just went up into the river channel and back down. They were spawning and the juveniles were surviving. And then that was a whole other dimension about flow management. Uh, which I, I couldn't believe. That means we didn't have to wait for a big flood. Maybe we can do something now with the flow in the river channel. So you've broken misconception. You, 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 well, you, yeah, in yeah. the idea that there was this idea that they only spawned in, in, in yeah, large yeah. flow events, and yeah. then you're looking at it going, hang on, that's not a large flow event, but they've spawned. Yeah, they, they, they've spawned and they've lived and, they've, and there's this strong year class three years later, and I'm thinking, wow. Okay, this, done. This, this is good because we can manage these flows, these, these in-channel flows. We can do something here. What's it like when those things happen? Are you ringing people around? Like this is just a little bit of, you know, an insight into the world of a fish ecologist. But it, it, what, what's your first point of contact when you when you discover something? Are you, are you fact-checking your work for the next week to no, make actually, sure you No, actually, right? I just blasted across the corridor to a colleague, hey, come and look at this, and pulled them across, look at this spreadsheet. Look at that. He says, what is this, a spreadsheet? No, no, look at it closely. No, you, you, no, you you just burst out with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just go out with it. Yeah. Very good. So as we kind of wrap this up, I'm interested to hear what you think needs to happen in the next 10 years, right? Let's work in 10... If, if we think it's a 100-year solution, let's work in 10-year increments. What is the next big thing we need to be tackling if we're not already tackling it? Is there one thing... If we're working in piecemeal, what yeah. is the first step? Okay, so... so, so so the, the first step is we've got to guarantee some minimum flows in these rivers. Absolutely. We cannot see the darling do what happened last time. So, you know, with these huge periods of zero flow and, and hot weather, which is predicted to get even hotter, we cannot let that happen again. Otherwise, the darling's going to die. And, and that's not an exaggeration. It, the fish will die and mussels will die. So uh, the ecosystem will die. So... This is not a scientist exaggerating. If you keep doing that, so we've got a flood now, but we'll have another drought. If you start to do that, so number one, you've got to provide minimum flows in these rivers. Now, the basin plan may be part of that. There may be, there may be more innovative solutions around that. It may be town water supplies. It may be irrigators coming to the table. 
it's got to be everyone coming coming to the table to say this is what you know we want for this river now the darling did stop flowing at times and, and that's part of it but I, when i looked at the data going back to you know 1850 the original data and, uh, and that's another spine tingling moment to go back to the original data and see hang on the darling actually flows 90 percent of the time in droughts that's not what people talk about they say the darling stops in droughts no it flows 90 percent of the time there was one event in, in 1901 where, where you know it stopped for 12 months that's a 100 year event most of the time it's flowing so, so, so we get some major preconception here. The darling flows most of the time. It needs minimum flows to survive. So, that's the first one. And then, then we add habitat. This is this is not uh, this is not a hard thing. Add flow and then add habitat. And that's snags. That's rocks. And then we start to get benefits back. And for me, I'd like to see some weirs removed. And then you add habitat. You add rocks and snags and pull out a weir. You start to get a flowing river. You start to get this complexity of hydraulics, native fish love it. Snags and rocks. Snags, rocks and flow. We mentioned off air, rocks are one thing we haven't explored a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yet, it seems to be something that particularly some of the project managers at Ozfish are starting to experiment with. And, and you mentioned that's a bit of a gold mine. That's something that they're onto yeah. something there. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think this, is, this, is a, this is brilliant. We, we, we have focused on, on snags and, uh, and because Historically, we had a lot of snags taken out, but yeah, we had rocks taken out. We had rock bars, you know, blasted. So that was part of the program desnagging. There was a, a program at the same time that cut through rock bars, that, that removed big rocks out of the river using dynamite. And uh, so the rock bars along the Darling, along the Murray. So the, much of those original rock bars are there, but we need to reconstruct some of them. And then there are rocks, that, there are other rock bars we, we should, you know, sort of re refurbish as well. I mean, rock was a, a major building material. Like it, gets take, it gets taken out pretty quickly. There's also really, you know, an incredibly important, you know, part of this is First Nations people. The, these rocks were part of cultural fish traps. Uh, I'm involved in a project to, to restore some of those on, on the Narrow River with the Dara Elders Group. But this is a big part of, of their culture. And so if we start res restoring this, you know, restoring their culture, we're all just part of restoring the river as well. Did, do you reckon they had it mapped out? Do you reckon they had an understanding of their rivers? When I say them, I mean mm. the indigenous population yep. that we could only dream of. First Nations people had such a deep understanding of the river, and a, a deep, deep understanding. I, I, uh, an amazing example for me is the Barana fish traps. The first time I went there, so it's 40 years ago, I'd studied fish biology. I, I knew quite a bit about migration by then. I was in my mid-20s. I understood about fish moving upstream and downstream. I studied a bit of civil engineering, so I understood about fishways, a bit of hydraulic engineering. I turn up to the Barwana fish traps, which is called Biami's Nagunu, and that's Biami's playground. And I found these ancient fish traps had civil engineering, that had hydraulic engineering, they understood fish migration at low flows, upstream and downstream. I was blown away by the depth of knowledge around that. So they had a deep, deep understanding. Wow. So they had basically done and executed what you had studied years yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, Without yeah, going yeah. to any college or any <laughs> oh. technology, you know, they just did it off their understanding. Oh, of yeah. Oh yeah, no, and, and, and this is, you know, we don't know the actual age of these traps, but certainly over, over 10,000 years and, and, and maybe 30, these are ancient, ancient traps. I, I tell you an amazing thing about them is that in civil engineering, the arched dam is one of the most common uh, types of dams you, know, you can build. And the earliest arched dam is, I think, by the Romans, you know, and, uh, and, and, and an arched dam supports the pressure of the water. These fish traps at Borona are actually small arched dams. So they knew the power, they knew the civil engineering structure associated with that arch. So, so, so you look at those and you think, oh, oh, why didn't they just build a barrier, a straight line barrier? Because it would have fallen over. <laughs> so there's a series of elegant arches. And what were they used for? 
they, they, they had, in springtime, they were captured a huge upstream migration of fish. And they would harvest fish from that and they would let fish go. And uh, they had corroborees there. And community, a lot of communities would come to this point because it, it's a very unusual point, Brian. It's a, it's a long rock bar. It's about 400 metres long. And then you have multiple fish traps on it. And so they'd come in spring have you know, big celebrations and Do you think we utilise their knowledge enough? No, we don't. I, I'm, I'm absolutely firm that we don't. And, and I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm again involved in this project with the Darrow Elders Group at Walgut, where we want to look at what the overlap of Western science and cultural science is. It's very obvious to me that there's a deep knowledge there. If you have to survive on the river, you develop a deep knowledge and you pass it on to your children. There's a deep oral history there. So absolutely, we, we need to engage with First Nations people. It's exciting to think what that could look like To Oh, yeah. Again, we've got a young history, we come back to it, but it's yeah. exciting to see if we tap into that, Yeah. how much more you could you know, you could know about the river, oh. and what, what that means for restoration projects, what that means for... Sure. for yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and we have to be partners. So, you know, and often, we, you know, it's being said that the First Nations people should be uh, stakeholders. You know, we, we're just going to move together mm. as partners and use our knowledge jointly. Excellent. Well, that is what I'm going to say is a look below the surface at what a freshwater river should look like, some of the issues, some of the solutions, some of your experience. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could speak for two hours on the topic and <laughs> hopefully we get you back on to talk about a range of different, you know, that's, that's call that an overview, a brief yeah. overview. And then, you know, we can dive into different topics, but um, it's been a pleasure having you on. A, um, a pleasure to be here. I'd, lo I'd love to come again. It's good fun. <laughs> it is good fun chatting about these yeah. things. Hopefully those listening at home can take a few of those messages, you know, yeah. share, share them at the pub, at the coffee shop, you know, tip people off to that there is deeper conversations to be had. Yeah. about the things and when i say the things i mean the sport the hobbies which is fishing that we love doing yeah there's more to just catching a cod on a lure on a swim bait and holding it up because you know sure th there's a lot of science a lot of research yeah. and a lot of you know time particularly of people like martins that have gone into allowing that to happen and hopefully it only gets better but until then we'll sign off and hopefully okay. we'll, we'll get you back on shortly thank you very much this project is funded by the Australian Government's Murray-Darling Healthy Rivers Program. The Healthy Rivers Program is funding community-led grants for on-ground projects that improve the health and ecological condition of rivers and wetlands across the basin, while supporting economic development and jobs. This project is also supported by BCF, Boating, Camping, Fishing.